And as we continue to think in terms of the family and what that looks like, I pray that you will equip us this morning. I pray that your word will speak with great power, uh, with great authority, with joy, uh, with relevance into each of our lives. Thanking you, Father, in advance of what you will do by means of your Holy Spirit and by your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the third grade Sunday school teacher had asked the pastor to come in and speak to her class about the subject of marriage and uh, thinking that it's never too early to start putting before children biblical principles of marriage. He said, of course, he would be happy to do that. So as he came into the class, he started off with a question, and his question to these third graders was, do any of you know what Jesus said about marriage? Thinking that they might have to stop and think about that for a moment, he was surprised when a little boy raised his hand, and he called on him, and he said, well, what do you think Jesus said about marriage? And the little boy said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. (laughs) Well, that's not exactly what he said about marriage. But I think all of us would agree that going into marriage, or even just thinking about marriage, nobody knows everything that there is to know about marriage, or at least we shouldn't think that way, should we? We all have much that we can learn about what it is that God has given us at this wonderful blessing. Whether we're single or whether we're married, God has uh, important things for us to learn. We know from previous uh, authors uh, that have written on this subject that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? We know that that same author wrote a book that's not quite as well-known as that one, which was entitled, What Your Mother Couldn't Tell You and Your Father Didn't Know uh, About Marriage. And then we know the gal who wrote the book entitled, It's Living Together That Makes Marriage Difficult. Otherwise, I guess that's not really much of a problem. So when we come this morning to our second lesson on family living God's way, we're going to start our... Uh, thoughts on this series really by looking at marriage. Since marriage is really the the foundation stone, it's the beginning of family life, we want to start off by seeing the divine purpose of marriage. And I would like for us to, to see this morning that marriage is a unique display. This is God's design. Its purpose is that it would be a unique display of His glory in this world. And it gives to every married couple the opportunity to live out the gospel every day. Now, we said that every one of us, single, married, widowed, divorced, wherever we are, we're to live out the gospel every day, aren't we? Marriage is going to be uniquely used by God to do that, as we're going to see from Scripture this morning. So we're going to look at two key passages of Scripture, very familiar ones, ones that we've looked at in the past, but I want to revisit them, and we're just going to trust the Holy Spirit's going to give us new insight and new appreciation for what these passages say as we think in terms of what God's purpose is in marriage. So let's do that together. What God says about marriage, and before we look at these passages, I want to put before you three essential perspectives that I hope will inform us as we come to these passages and help us to think them through uh, biblically together. The first one is that our marriages are lived out in the middle of, the, of a world that does not function as God originally intended. That's important that we know that, right? We live in a world that is not functioning the way God originally created it and intended for it to function. Those of you that have been with us for the past few months know that we finished up 1 Peter and we went into 2 Peter. And those are two little epistles that really drive home this point of the kind of world that we live in and the kind of things that we face. And when you think in terms of what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, which really captures the essence of it, and in verses 6 and 7, this is what he said, "...in this you greatly rejoice, even though for now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials." that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise, the glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter has a step back and say the world that we live in, the world that's not as God originally created and intended, can be summarized with these three words. And in those two verses, he, put, he lifts up three words, the word distress, the word trials, and the word tests. Now, that doesn't mean that every moment of every day of our life has to be summarized in that way, does it? But that is very much a part of the process that God has us in. And and I say that because if the goal of our life becomes personal happiness, personal joy, personal self-fulfillment, we're going to be disappointed a lot because that's not what God is, is about. 
does he want us to be happy? Of course he wants us to experience happiness and joy. But he has a different way of bringing us to where he wants us to be than the world puts before us. And so these reminders from 1 Peter tell us that in this world that we live in, we're going to have trials. We're going to have stress. There are going to be tests. And you know what? God uses all of those things to advance personal holiness in our lives. That's God's intent. That's God's purpose. That would be a God-stated goal for us that we would come to a, a, great, a, a point of greater personal holiness. And so we begin by just understanding that this world that we live in is not as God originally intended. Secondly, to go with that, marriage is the union of two imperfect people, right? Marriage is the union of two imperfect people. Now, if you're married, that's not news because all of us know that, right? The best that any of us can hope for, the best that any of us can hope for is to marry another imperfect person. We're not looking for a perfect person. We can't possibly find that person because they don't exist, do they? Therefore, we know that there is no such thing as a perfect marriage. We can look at other people and wish, oh, I wish our marriage was like that. Well, if you knew what they were struggling with and what they were going through, you'd realize that they have a lot of the issues that you have. Now, maybe they're handling them differently, but they face the same things that you face, that I face. And so one of the things that we, we remember is that marriage is always the coming together of two imperfect people. Stanley uh, Hauerwas put it this way. He says, we never know whom we should marry. We just think we, we never know whom we marry, whom we marry. We never know whom we marry. We just think we do. Or even if we first marry the right person, just give it a while, and he or she will change. For marriage being the enormous thing it is means that we're not the same person after we entered it. The primary problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. Now, he makes another very uh, kind of shocking statement, and, and that is to say, you know, stop looking for the right person to marry. He goes so far as to say, and I think he's doing it to make a point and kind of just to get in people's faces, he says, there isn't the right person to marry. Because if you're so fixated on the right person to marry, then when you get to this point, you'd realize, oh, I've married an imperfect person. And, and they aren't the person that I thought they were. Then I think what he is saying is then there's just that many more issues, right? We each bring into the marriage relationship something that runs counter to what God wants for us to experience. And what we bring into that marriage relationship is called a sin nature, a propensity to sin, the principle of sin that abides within all of us. So it's fair to say, I think, that most marriages do not implode because someone within that marriage, the husband or the wife, intentionally, purposefully decided, I'm just going to blow this up. Does that happen? Of course it happens. But I would say that the far greater number of marriages that get into trouble, get into trouble because of little things that then later, because they're ignored and not dealt with, become bigger things, and then great big things. It's the weed in the garden principle, right? When we deal with those little things, when they are to be dealt with, then they don't become the big things. But the reality is we all have married an imperfect person. And a part of that first point is to say in this world that we live in, God's going to use an imperfect person to conform us into a greater likeness of his son because that's the calling that he has placed on our life. Thirdly, and this is, of course, the good part, that God's grace is at work. God's grace is at work. This is the good news, isn't it? God is faithful in the midst of this. We're not left alone. We're not on our own. That's why there's hope for every marriage. That's why there's hope for every family. Why? Not because we're going to get it together at some point and figure it all out necessarily, but because God is at work, because his grace is at work. So we need to have a realistic view of our marriage, that it's not perfect. It's not ever going to be perfect. We need to have a realistic view of our family. It's not perfect. It's not ever going to be perfect. But we can still, in the context of that, be hopeful. We can be hopeful because God's grace is available. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is at work. He's redeeming. He's pursuing. He's calling us to himself and into a greater relationship with him. So then, with that in mind, let's go to the first of these two passages. And if you are thinking with me, go to Genesis 2, because this is the, the place we would naturally begin, right? 
Genesis 2, the unchanging principles that flow out of this passage are just amazing. And I know that almost uh, uh, all of you are familiar, at least on some level, with Genesis 2 and the things that are put forward in this passage. I would say if this is all that we had in Scripture, if this is all we had about marriage, we would understand that what God is doing in the context of marriage is something very significant and very important. Just because this passage puts before us some very significant principles about what it is that God wants us to achieve and to see. This is the passage that Jesus quotes in the New Testament. This is the passage that Paul quotes in the New Testament. So this is the go-to passage. So let's go to it in Genesis chapter 2 and begin reading at verse 18, and then we'll come back and draw some principles out of this. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all of the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the, the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Seven principles that flow out of this passage. And the first one is that marriage is rooted in our incompleteness. Marriage is rooted in our incompleteness. That's the way it begins, doesn't it, in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And as you know, this is the first time in the whole creative account that we read that something isn't good. Up until this point, everything has been good, and it's not only been good, God concluded the first chapter and said it's very good. So as he looked at what he had done, at what he had created, it was good. Then when we come to this 18th verse for the first time, we're introduced to this statement that something isn't good. And it literally reads, not good is man's aloneness. Not good is man's aloneness. And I think what we need to see is that this is a declaration that God makes. This is the sovereign God who's created the universe and called it into existence. This is the, this is the declaration that he makes. This is not self-realization on the part of Adam. At this point, Adam is a happy camper. He, he has been created by God. We haven't gotten to the rest of the, the, of the verses so that as you begin verse 18, it's God's declaration that we want to see is really the underpinnings of this statement. Before anything else has happened, verse 18, God says, God announces, Adam, it is not good for you to be alone. So I would say man's aloneness at this point in the story has been designed by God. It anticipates something that's coming. It anticipates what God is going to do. But at this point, Adam is made aware of that by God himself. The second principle is that marriage, then, is of God's design. God's the designer, isn't he? God's is the one who has put this together in the way that he has. I will make him a helper, God says. I will make him a helper suitable for him. I will make one who corresponds to him. And again, we simply acknowledge that what the text says is that this is a work that God does. Adam doesn't get any credit for this at all, does he? He's asleep after all. There's probably a joke in there somewhere, but I won't go there. But Adam doesn't get any credit for it at all. He's sleeping. Eve can't get any credit for it. She hasn't yet been created. And so God is the one that the, that the story tells us is the, the star of this unfolding account. He is the one who divinely creates. It is his design. And that's why it's so sad, isn't it, as we watch what happens in our culture, knowing as we do this principle that marriage is of God's design. And it saddens us when we look at the world and the world's approach to marriage. And the world's approach to marriage is basically to look at marriage through the lens of limitation. And the world increasingly looks at marriage through the lens of limitation on a whole range of issues. For some people, as they read this account, there's the limitation of one man and one woman. And the word one is what hangs them up. 
And yet God said his intent was there uh, for there to be monogamy, not polygamy. Not many wives, not many husbands. The story of Scripture unfolds, doesn't it, that the culture that God's people lived in were a polygamous culture, and it even came into the, into the people of God, and God shows us the consequence every time of what that results in. And so the world looks at the limitation, and they say, well, there's a limitation there of one and one. Some others look at the limitation, and they, they, they see what that verse says, and they say, one man and one woman? Well, why do we have to have the limitation of a man and a woman? Why, why, why can't we broaden our perspective, and why can't it be two men or two women? And so there's the limitation that heterosexuality brings to people, and they would suggest that that in somehow restricts people becoming all that God intends for them to be. The pursuit of, of happiness and joy in their life is being deprived in some manner because there's this limitation of, of, of marriage that people have put on us. Other people look at that verse and say, the idea of one person for all of life? Well, that, yeah, that can't be. And yet, this passage is going to speak of permanence, isn't it? And so, the world looks at this, and we have this battle going on that we're all so mindful of, this battle that's taking place within the public square, within the culture, and within the courts. The world isn't sure what to do with marriage, but they know this. The world isn't sure what to do with marriage, but they know this. They know it's important. And they know they want to do something oftentimes that's outside of God's design and outside of God's intent. So when we look at this second chapter of the book of Genesis, here is God's design for marriage. And it is he who has purposefully put it together for us on our behalf. Thirdly, the principle here is of companionship, right? Marriage is for companionship. The man is alone, and the man needs a companion. And here's the interesting part that as you read this story, you don't go from God's declaration of Adam, by the way, did you know that you were alone, to God providing for him, do you? You don't go from the declaration that, Adam, there's something that's not good here to God immediately solving that issue. And it almost seems that as we read this story that it's disjunctive, that it, that it doesn't flow the way we think it should. Because, in fact, what we see happen is not God immediately solving the problem, but we see God enrolling Adam in Zoology 101, right? And Adam becomes a namer of animals. Very interesting part of the story. Speaks of the of the uh, creativity of God, doesn't it? And the way that he uh, brings things about in our lives always differently than we expect. We would just, I imagine, look at this problem and say, well, we know how to solve it. Here's the answer. Boom. Here's the solution, Adam. Here's Eve. God doesn't do it that way. He has Adam name these animals. And as Adam does this, what do you think Adam learns as he goes through that process that we read about in verses 19 to 20, all of these animals... Uh, that, that God has created, and he brings them before Adam. Well, we know what Adam learns. No, we, we, we know that he learns there's a he and there's a she. Every species that comes by has got a he and a she. He, he learns that there's the sense of companionship then between them, right? As he watches them go by, they seem to be enjoying life. They're happy. They're together. There's companionship. And then, of course, there's that sense of completeness, isn't there? There's that sense of completeness. Adam learns as he observes this that he doesn't have that. He doesn't have that partnership. He doesn't have that companionship. He doesn't have that one who completes him and who corresponds to him. So within this design, within this purpose, God not only tells Adam it's not good for you to be alone, God not only unfolds the design that he has for marriage and his, uh, his purpose and plan in that, but he does it with a very clear understanding that it is about companionship. And then the fourth principle, marriage is a relationship of attraction. Marriage is a relationship of attraction. You look at verse 23, and, and the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And I would imagine that Adam is going to give a gentle rebuke to everybody who's taught on Genesis 2 about what he said and the way that he said it because we're going to have to ask him for a reenactment, right, of what he actually said when he saw Eve for the first time because it, it, it can't hardly be captured in just these words on a piece of paper, can it? But that's what he said. 
He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. At last. In other words, the one that I've been looking for, as God has brought all of these animals before me, and I've realized that there isn't anybody that corresponds to me. There isn't anybody like me. There isn't anybody that I'm attracted to in the way that, that, that God intends for me to be. Well, then he learns that this one whom now God is going to bring to him is the one who corresponds to him. It's not good for him to be alone. He now sees Eve, and Eve corresponds to him. And I think there's something very significant in that statement in terms of him seeing in Eve someone who is created in the image and likeness of God, just as he is. That's one of the big distinctions between the animal world and, and, and the uh, humanity. And, and the more that distinction gets blurred, the greater will be our uh, inability to see clearly the way God wants us to about things that are this fundamental and important in life. Because what he sees in Eve is different than he saw in any animal. He saw one who corresponded to him because she too was made in the image and likeness of God, and he was attracted to her because of that. The fifth principle is marriage is a particular union. Marriage is a particular union, isn't it? God calls a man and a woman to be together for this cause, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. So it is the first and the most basic of all of the institutions that God has made. There is a language here in this text of unity. There's a language of interdependence. There's a language of correspondence. There's a language that is complementary to each other. And it reminds us that God is bringing together a union that is a particular kind to accomplish his purpose in, in marriage. And then the sixth principle, marriage is a public covenant. Marriage is a public covenant. Verse 22, when we read that the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man, didn't he? And we have all heard different accounts of how that could almost play out, couldn't it, in a marriage ceremony with God being the one who is conducting that ceremony. And I think that's exactly the intent that we should draw. It's almost as if this is official kind of language. There's something very uh, significant going on here. God brought her to Adam, and we have this picture of this exchange taking place, and, and, and clearly the text says that you shall leave Adam, your father and your mother. Well, of course, Adam didn't have a father and a mother, but the, the principle is timeless, how do we begin to live a family and, and, and to have a family and live family life God's way? Well, you begin by getting married. That's God's intent for a family, that you leave your father and your mother. That is a temporary relationship. That's why at some point in the future we'll have to talk about what is the goal of parenting. It isn't to hold on to them. It, the, hold, the, the intent of parenting is to raise them, to release them to let them go. And we see so many parents that, that hold on to their children beyond the time that they should be and, and not properly releasing. And yet that's the very message that is sent here. You leave your father and your mother. You honor them forever, but you leave them very purposefully, very intentionally, because that is a temporary relationship. The permanent relationship that God has created is this marriage relationship. And so as one ends, another begins. By God's design, we have a new family that has come into existence. And then the seventh principle, marriage is a lifelong relationship. Marriage is a lifelong relationship. That's the context. When, when Jesus quotes from Genesis 2, it is in the context of him seeing marriage as being something very permanent. Matthew 19 and Mark 10, Jesus calls on Genesis 2 to, to buttress his argument for the permanency of marriage, that his intent is that it is a man and it is a woman who come together and they come together for all of life. God designed that with that purpose in mind. And so there we see from Genesis seven principles that really flow out of what God intends for each one of our marriages. I'd like to then have us turn to Ephesians 5. And let's go back to the other a part of Scripture in the New Testament and go to Ephesians 5 and just see some amazing realities of, of what Ephesians 5 puts before us. And you remember when we come to Ephesians 5, we said a couple weeks ago when we just touched on this passage for another reason, that, that this whole 
passage that flows from 5 into 6 and really has to do with uh, relationships and has to do with marriage and has to do with parenting and family and children, all of that, it really begins in the opening of that chapter by saying, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. And then he gets into the meat of that passage and he's saying, as he does in verse 18, you know how this is going to happen? This is going to happen because you're not going to be drunk with wine, but in fact, you're going to instead be filled with the Spirit. So everything that he says about these relationships really hinges on that passage, doesn't it, that says you can't do this on your own. You're going to have to do it in the power of God's Spirit. And then he launches into marriage. And from marriage, he then will go, of course, to talking to husbands and to wives, and then he'll talk about families, and he'll talk about parents, and he'll talk about children, all in that context of uh, being filled with God's Spirit. The first thing I want you to see in this Ephesians 5 passage, we're going to go to the end of the passage, and I want you to see there's a mystery here. There's a mystery that is uh, unfolded before us in verse 31 and verse 32. Here's where Paul quotes from Genesis 2. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Established in Genesis 2, Paul says there's a hidden meaning. This is amazing that here we are are, are hundreds and thousands of years removed from Moses' teaching in Genesis 2 about marriage, all right? So we've gone all through this period of time, and then the Holy Spirit of God gives to Paul an insight into what God created in the context of marriage, and Paul puts this label musterion, mystery, on something that he's going to say about marriage. And the idea of this word mystery is not that it's something that's incomprehensible. That might have an application at times, right? But, but marriage is not incomprehensible. He's not saying marriage is something that you can never figure out. That, that's not the word mystery. It isn't that it's incomprehensible. It's not that you can't figure it out. Scripture, when it uses this word mystery, is not using it the way we often use that word. Rather, when you see the word mystery in the New Testament, it's saying to you, pay attention because here's a truth that God is revealing that to this point had not been made known. That's a New Testament mystery. And there are a number of mysteries in the New Testament where the Spirit of God says, here, let me pull back the curtain a little bit and give you a greater insight into what God is doing. And that's what he says here about marriage. Marriage is a mystery in that sense. There's a truth here that's being revealed that hadn't... And what is the truth? What is the mystery about marriage that Paul wants us to know? It's this. Marriage between a man and a woman is meant to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. That's the mystery. The mystery is that marriage between a man and a woman is meant to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. Now, that is a profound and amazing thing. That is a reality that to this point, nobody had put that together. The church, as it has unfolded in God's prophetic program, is in fact to be a picture and a reflection of our marriage, not the other way around. But we look at the relationship between Christ and the church, and what does that say? Well, fundamentally, it says this, the marriage relationship transcends every other human relationship. It says the marriage relationship transcends every relationship other than my relationship to God. My relationship to God is first and primary. My relationship within the context of marriage, those that God has not given the gift of singleness to, and I take it if God has given the gift of singleness, then he does something else in that process of ministering in the life of that person because we know that's a gift that God gives. But for those who are married, he is saying that this now lifts marriage out of what can be at times a mundane, routine relationship. And he says, you need to see it differently. You need to see that this relationship has been created by God to reflect the very glory of God in the world. Now, we ever get this, this can be a life changer. This can be a transformer to see this mystery in the way that the Apostle Paul, by means of the Holy Spirit, puts this before us that God has invested the marriage relationship with eternal significance because it reflects the relationship between Jesus and the church. Let's look at that. Living the mystery, 
this wedding portrait? What is this to show? We aren't going to have time to get into the details of this, but let's just fly over so at least we have a general understanding of what it is that the wife does. What, what does the wife do? Well, in this marriage portrait, in this marriage relationship, we know as he describes it, she is to be in submission to her husband. She is to be supportive and, and, and an encouragement to him. She does it willingly, not by compulsion. She does it ultimately because she's doing it and she's offering it to God. The husband, on the other hand, what does he do? Well, the husband, all he has to do, he just has to love his wife the way Christ loved the church. He has to love his wife sacrificially. He is to be giving daily to his wife his very life in service to his wife. So if you step back from this and you say her submission to her husband is all-encompassing, she is to submit to him in everything as unto the Lord. And you step back and you say, and the husband, his mission, his assignment is all-consuming. It is all-consuming because he is to love and picture in his relationship to his wife the way Jesus loves us as the church. This, he said, has been a mystery that God is now making known, that what God started in the garden in creating this marriage relationship and this purposeful union, this completing, this companionship, this bringing together of this man and this woman for all of their lives, God now tells us further that he has invested it with an even greater privilege. And that privilege is it is to be a daily display of the glory of God in the gospel to the world. Which brings me then to what it is that we want to take away this morning. And that is simply this, that every marriage is to be a mini-drama of the gospel. Every marriage is to be a mini-drama of the gospel. Christ-likeness on display to the world as they see two people being transformed by the power of God's Spirit in such a way that they're both pursuing the very best for each other. And in the process of that, they fail. And in the process of that, they stumble and fall, but they get back up and they start over again because it is a part of the redeeming grace of God that is on display to the world. That is the gospel, isn't it? The essence of the gospel, as we hear the testimonies of people's lives, it is a beautiful thing to realize that God takes us in our brokenness, in our sin, and he is about the business of restoring and rebuilding and refreshing, and he does it every day in our lives, doesn't he? That's the living out of the gospel. And that's the way we're to look at our marriage. That's the way we're to face every day. How is it that I can serve you and do the best for you so that I can put on display the gospel of God within our home and within our family? Because that's where it begins. It doesn't begin in here. It begins at home to where our children, our friends, our family, they're to see the gospel on display as we seek the best for each other. And as you think of that, then I would ask then secondly that we think daily of our marriage as a portrait. I love this idea of our marriage being a portrait, of our marriage being a, a, a painting. And in this assignment, I, I, just, I would have us think daily. This is, our, this is our assignment for the week, all right? That we would think daily of our marriage as a portrait, that we would think daily of our marriage as a painting, and, it, and it's a painting of the relationship between Christ and the church. And I have to think of what is my part? How is it that I contribute as a husband to the picture that's being painted today in my relationship with Bonnie? How is it that I am contributing to something that's beautiful, to something that is particularly glorifying to God, something that is putting on display the gospel of His grace? Or how is it that I may, in fact, by selfishness or pride or wrong responses or, or harsh words might be marring this portrait, might be disfiguring this portrait, might be in some way not enhancing this picture of what Christ and the church look like, but in fact detracting from it. And, and it's just my heart and my thought is, as I went through this passage to, to ask God every day from this point forward, God, what kind of a picture am I painting? What kind of a picture am I painting? 
What, what kind of, what do those words add that, that I, I'm just ready to speak? What do those words add to this picture? What do those thoughts add to the picture? What does that attitude add to the picture? What does that heart for, for Bonnie add to the picture? Or what does it take away? And it can be a transforming thing when we, when we realize that what God has done in creating this, this, this wonderful relationship that is not just about my personal fulfillment, personal happiness, personal joy. It's about my personal holiness and how it is that I can sacrifice my life for somebody else. And then when I fail, I can receive forgiveness. I can be renewed. I can begin again painting this picture that God has commissioned that be done in the name of his son. That's what marriage and the beginning of a family is all about. May God give us the grace to be painting beautiful pictures, not because we're perfect people, because we're not, not because we have perfect families, because we don't, but because we have people who walk daily in the gospel and seek the face of God so that we can properly display his glory. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this amazing account that we are all so familiar with but yet, Lord, that, that has so much for us just in terms of how we live out our daily life and our daily walk. And Lord, I know that in the listening to my words and, and in this room this morning, there are varying stages of, of joy and there are varying stages of heartache. There are varying relational issues that are a part of what you're doing in our lives. Lord, I pray that you will give us the courage and the grace, the courage to be honest about ourselves first, the courage to, to look deep within our own hearts and lives and to see what it is that you would want to point out to us. And, and Father, the, the faith to believe you for accomplishing and producing something that is good and beautiful and perfect in the end because it's going to ultimately be that, that you are the one that is glorified and honored. Father God, I pray that as we continue in these thoughts in the weeks that will be ahead of us, that your grace will meet us right where we are, that you will give to us the, the ability to trust you and to believe you for what you can do in each one of our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.